everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2024 Lifestyle Medicine webinar series that is being hosted by the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Thank you very much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us for this one hour session. Um, so welcome to this webinar on transforming diabetes care by harnessing the power of lifestyle medicine by Dr. Sivaneswar and Pubala Singham. I am uh, Mufida Faus, VP Education for the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and I'll be your moderator for today. We are very excited to have with us Dr. Siva, who is an MD in Malaysia. Uh, he also holds a diploma from the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. He serves as the Lifestyle Medicine Expert Consultant with the WHO for the Lifestyle Medicine Diabetes Remission Project, which in his in its pilot phase has been quite successful. He's the founder and president of the Malaysian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and he also holds positions in the advisory board of the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine and the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance and the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. Dr. Siva is also a member of the US-based True Health Initiative Council, the Global Positive Health Institute Advisory Council, and the National Coalition for Mental Wellness in Malaysia. We're very, very excited to have him here with us um, and to learn from him. But before we get started, there are just a couple of things to go through so you can get the most out of this webinar. So over the next 30 to 45 minutes, Dr. Siva will be talking to us about the topic, following which we will be very happy to take questions for another 15 minutes. Please post your questions in the chat box that's on the right-hand side, and we will take them at the end of the session. In case you miss any part of the webinar or you have to leave early, this session is being recorded and will be uploaded later on our YouTube channel. Please also kindly ensure that the mics are muted on your end. And lastly, once this is once the webinar is over, if you have time at the end, we'd be so grateful if you could fill out the questionnaire for us. It will help us to improve things for you in the future. So and over to you, Dr. Siva. Thank you, Dr. Mufida, uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, a very good evening to everyone. I'm very pleased to be on this platform with all of you all. And I'd like to thank the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine for inviting me. So what I am going to do now is I will share my slides and then we'll get started with our topic. All right, so uh, welcome to our session on transforming diabetes care, um, harnessing the power of lifestyle medicine. And um, our learning objectives for today, we're going to look at diabetes remission as the goal of type two diabetes treatment, um, introduction to lifestyle medicine. Uh, we're going to try and understand the physiology of insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. And we'll look at plant-based diet and its role in reversing insulin resistance and <clears throat> um, reversing and remission of diabetes as well. Now worldwide, we are experiencing a diabetes tsunami. So currently, 537 million people have diabetes, and it's expected that by 2030, um, this figure will rise to 578 million people that who will have uh, or who will suffer from diabetes. Now, what is really alarming is that one in two adults with diabetes are undiagnosed. Now, <clears throat> the cost of managing or treating diabetes is escalating and it is becoming unsustainable, right? Now, if we look at uh, the figures in 2021, right? Um, globally, we are spending about 966 billion uh, US dollars and yet we don't really see any um, great outcomes, right? We're spending a lot of money on treatment, but people are suffering and there's uh, increasing morbidity and mortality. And this figure is supposed to rise to 1.05 trillion by 2045. Now, in Sri Lanka, uh, according to the uh, study that was published in the BMJ uh, Open Diabetes Research and Care, um, the statistics show that one in four adults, or rather 23%, uh, percent, uh, the prevalence of diabetes is 23%, and the prevalence of pre-diabetes is 30.5%. And... Uh, <clears throat> There's also some statistics that show that 40% of uh, people who have uh, diabetes are undiagnosed in Sri Lanka. And um, the other interesting thing that I um, noticed when I was reading some of the material was that 
um, there's a high incidence of diabetes and pre-diabetes in people who are who have a normal BMI. And the researchers then have alluded to the fact that maybe we need to look uh, at a different BMI reading and maybe the BMI readings that are used for Asians um, are maybe still high for us. That's interesting even for me uh, because Sri Lanka leads Asia in the prevalence of diabetes and Malaysia follows closely, right? Our prevalence of diabetes is also huge. Um, our 2019 um, National Health and Mobility Survey shows that 18.3% um, suffer from diabetes, which was a huge jump from 2011. We, we saw a 68% increase. And if we look at uh, the amount of money that, for example, I'm using Malaysia as an example, how much we are spending, all right, uh, we're spend, spending close to about US 2 billion um, to treat NCDs, which is about 16 0.8% of the country's health expenditure. Now, of that, 45% of our allocation for uh, NCDs is being spent on diabetes. And again, the, the same situation, we don't really see uh, much of an outcome in the sense that our figures are still escalating. And see, we always talk about the cost that we use to sp uh, spend on treatment, but we also have the indirect loss due to loss of productivity and diabetes recorded the highest productivity loss at about US um, 1.2 billion, right? Now, this will probably be a scenario that we will also see in Sri Lanka. I couldn't actually find uh, the, the statistics for the cost uh, in terms of expenditure. But, um, you know, when I, uh, when we were, when I was in Doha last and we looked at Qatar statistics, uh, it's, it's just that the percentage that varies, but everybody is spending a lot of money, right? So let's define type 2 diabetes very quickly. I'm sure all of you know the definition of type 2 diabetes. All right, so it is characterized by progressive decline in beta cell function associated with insulin resistance in muscle and adipose tissue, which leads to an increased hepatic glucose output and reduced utilization of glucose by the target organs, all right? contributing to fasting hypoglycemia. And of course, diagnosis of diabetes, HbA1c levels of 6.5% uh, uh, or more, it be, uh, according to IDF, and uh, or fasting blood sugar of more than 7 and 2-hour postprandial of more than 11.1. Now, we know that insulin plays a central role in glucose metabolism, okay? Uh, and insulin that is released from the pancreas needs to bind to the insulin receptors on the cells. Now, what happens when insulin binds to the insulin receptors is that it activates the GLUT4 or rather the glucose transporter type 4, which then uh, translocates to the cell membrane. And this allows the glucose from the blood to be taken by the cells. Now, Let's then move on and look at what do we mean by insulin resistance at a cellular level. Okay, Of course, the definition is um, it is defined as the inability of target tissues to increase glucose uptake in response to insulin, which eventually leads to type 2 diabetes. So when there is insulin resistance, one is there can be a decrease in insulin receptors. But more importantly than that, what um, we want to talk about today is also accumulation of fats in cells that are not supposed to have fats. For example, in muscle, if you have a lot of intramyocellular lipids, this is going to block the signaling uh, when the insulin binds to the insulin receptor. And when the signaling is blocked, then the translocation of the GLUT4 to the cell membrane is impaired and hence glucose utilization is impaired. So hold this thought and then we will talk a little bit more about uh, lipotoxicity as we go along, all right? Now, very quickly, if you look at what causes insulin resistance, all right, it is overconsumption of uh, calories, high calorie diet, foods that are um, energy dense but nutrient empty. So these excess calories are converted into fat. Now, <clears throat> there's these excess fat that is deposited into adipose tissues, all right? They will grow in number and size. But when they are deposited into uh, tissues where they're not supposed to be, in ectopic tissues like the liver, 
pancreas and muscle, then you get lipotoxicity. Of course, uh, excess fat leads to obesity. Now, diets that are high in saturated fat, trans fats, and animal protein also contributes to insulin resistance um, as diet that's a high in sugar and simple carbohydrates. So what are the drivers of insulin resistance, right? So if we look at the main drivers of insulin resi resistance, one is oxidative stress, which leads to inflammation. Then we have lipotoxicity and dysbiosis. So today we will talk a little bit more about lipotoxicity and dysbiosis, but very briefly, right? Like uh, when we eat excessive sugar or if we eat a lot of trans fats, or saturated fat, all right, it creates an oxidative stress in the body, which leads uh, to inflammation, right? Uh, inflammation uh, drives insulin resistance. So what are ectopic fats? As I mentioned earlier, they are fat, uh, fats that are deposited in non-adipose tissue, right? In the muscle, this intramyocellular lipid leads to insulin resistance and also plays a role in increasing inflammatory mediators. So it also contributes to the inflammation that we talked about, right? And in pancreas, the deposits of fat can lead to beta cell dysfunction and also beta cell death, right? And in the liver, so these deposits of fat lead to uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that has now gained um, a lot of importance, right? Because it plays a central role in metabolic disorders. Uh, this leads to hepatic insulin resistance and also increase in glucose production from the liver. <laughs> now, in our gut, we have uh, good bacteria and we have bad bacteria, right? The gut microbiome. So we have a mixture of uh, good bacteria and bad, bad, bad bacteria, right? Now, Evidence suggests that the entire gut microbiome plays an important role in metabolic, endocrine, and immune function. So it plays a role in uh, how we manage uh, our weight and how we manage sugar and how we manage cholesterol. It also uh, plays a significant role in our immune function and also plays a, an important role in our <clears throat> um, gut-brain axis, right? Now, what happens when uh, these bacteria in this microbiome, when they actually uh, ferment fiber and resistant starch in the colon, we produce short chain fatty acids, all right? Now, one of the short chain fatty acids called butyrate plays a significant role in the management of diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. It also helps to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress, helps to improve insulin sensitivity, helps to decrease cholesterol and triglycerides, and helps to improve satiety. Now, unfortunately, you know, um, we more or less tend to have dysbiosis or rather an imbalance of gut microflora, and we don't actually have the 70-30 uh, ratio, but, you know, it's, a, it's more disordered, and there's loss of beneficial bacteria. And why do we have this loss of beneficial bacteria? Many reasons. Okay, it could be the type of diet that we eat, low fiber diet, high sugar, a lot of preservatives, food additives, um, stress, constipation, excessive use of antibiotics, all right? Now, this biosis is strongly associated with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, poor, poor immunity, and colon cancer. Now, if we look at, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about constipation. So, World over, uh, many people suffer from constipation, and I'm sure it's the same with Sri Lanka as it is in, in Malaysia as in other countries. So if we compare someone eating a standard American diet, right? so we are not actually eating a standard American diet per se, but with globalization, uh, everybody tends to eat um, fast food, and within our own diet as well, we also have our uh, type of unhealthy diet as well, right? Um, and so if you look at it today being Saturday, so if you look at the image on the top, all right, so the person is just uh, passing out Wednesday's dinner. So the person is holding Thursday's food, three meals, Friday's food, three meals, and Saturday's meals as well, right? Now, if a person has a high fiber diet, all right, he's passing out Friday's meal and he's just holding Saturday's meal. 
So if a person is constipated and holds all this fecal matter, then it's all going to putrefy and increase uh, toxicity in the colon, and this is going to lead to dysbiosis. Okay. So when we are looking at patients with um, diabetes or any of these chronic disorders, it is also important to uh, look at how their gut is functioning as well, because there is an interplay between gut health and uh, metabolic syndrome or diabetes, right? Now, let's look at very quickly at the risk factors for diabetes. We know diabetes is a multifactorial disease, right? And it can be, be, can be categorized into two groups, the modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors, which include genetics, race, and age. So we'll look a little bit at the modifiable risk factors. So obviously, a uh, high calorie diet, which is uh, which has a lot of simple carbohydrates, um, a lot of sugar, uh, isolated fructose, a diet that's high in saturated fats, low fiber diet will increase the risk of diabetes. So for example, if you look at the image uh, here, there's uh, Kalum. I think that's a popular Sri Lankan um, oil-based sweet dish. Okay, uh, And if you look on the right, we have nas um, you know, a favorite Malaysian dish, which is rice cooked in uh, coconut milk. And, um, you know, it's very high in calories. And then cakes, uh, cereals with isolated sugar. And we have uh, sweet tea. And if you have a lot of um, foods that are high in saturated fats, like what you see in the images here, so you hardly see any um, fruits or vegetables. Now, this tends to be like a typical meal that a lot of people tend to eat, right? Now, this is a research from Malaysia. So I'll just share that uh, because that shows, uh, you know, the dietary intake and obesity of Malaysian adults. So Malaysians tend to eat um, less carbohydrate, all right? So when we talk about carbohydrate, it doesn't mean that all carbohydrates are bad. So what's happening is we tend to eat a little bit less of the carbohydrate, but we eat a lot of fat and a lot of protein. So which means a lot of Malaysians are eating um, a lot of animal protein. Now, uh, according to what I read, uh, the Sri Lankan statistics show that in Sri Lanka, people tend to eat a lot of carbohydrate, more than 70%. Your fat, the fat intake seems to be at about 20% and protein seems to be low, about 10 to 11%. Again, um, sugar intake in Sri Lanka seems to be at 36 uh, grams per day and intake of fiber is quite similar to Malaysia, it's low. Now, uh, those Sri Lanka uh, takes a lot of carbohydrate, but I would assume that, you know, uh, based on the fact that um, these chronic diseases are high, people are probably eating a lot of simple carbohydrate, right? A rice that is um, uh, um, that is very processed instead of the red rice that is easily available and that is, uh, you know, that's very healthy that's uh, found in Sri Lanka. So here in, uh, in, in this article that was published by a researcher from Malaysia, so a diet that's high in calorie, energy dense and nutrient empty increases the risk of type two diabetes, obesity and other chronic diseases. Because a diet that is high in simple carbohydrate, sugar, saturated fat, and animal protein with low intake of fruits and uh, vegetables and plant protein and fiber will increase the drivers of um, uh, inf uh, driver, drivers of insulin resistance, which is inflammation, oxidative stress, ectopic fats, and gut dysbiosis. So the type of diet that um, we eat will predispose us or rather help us to drive forward this insulin resistance. Uh, the, of course, the other modifiable risk factors that we may not have much time to talk about today, but I'll just mention it in the passing, of course, is a sedentary lifestyle. So um, a sedentary lifestyle, of course, increases the risk of all types of NCDs, including diabetes, and uh, sitting is now considered to be the new smoking then stress, lack of sleep, smoking, poor social connectivity, uh, alcohol consumption, are uh, all modifiable risk factors. That maybe at another uh, time, we may discuss more uh, about these other factors. So let's now uh, talk a little bit about the history of uh, type 2 diabetes management. So the focus of treatment of type 2 diabetes has always been regulating blood glucose 
and preventing the development of complications. So it was always two-pronged. And we do whatever we can to make sure that, you know, that we have the parameters right by increasing the medication or uh, varying the type of medicines that we need to use. And there was a general consensus. Uh, so I've just put out some examples, like uh, there's no cure for diabetes and it's a lifelong disease. Okay. So when did this change, right? The change began after bariatric surgery. So what happened was uh, this researcher by the name of Henry Buckwald, he did a systemic review and meta-analysis, which was published in JAMA. So he just uh, wanted to determine the impact of bariatric surgery on weight loss, um, operative mortality outcome, and the four obesity comorbidities, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and obstructive sleep apnea. And what uh, the outcome was that he found that diabetes was completely resolved in 76.8% of patients and resolved or improved in 86% of the patients. So that means when a patient went for bariatric surgery and they removed all this excess fat, this led to uh, either the diabetes being resolved uh, or improved and hyperlipidemia improved in 70% of the patients and hypertension was resolved in 61% of the patients. Now, this then uh, set the motion uh, going uh, and in 2009, there was a consensus statement that was initiated by the American Diabetes Association and uh, the American Diabetes Association then suggested that we need to use the word remission, uh, which signifies abatement or disappearance of the signs and symptoms to be adopted as a descriptive term in managing type 2 diabetes. So moving forward to 2022, the consensus group then set the remission criteria. So what do we mean by remission? Okay. So the American Diabetes Association, the Endocrine Society, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and Diabetes UK, and this was published in the various journals as listed here. And uh, they <clears throat> set the remission criteria and termed it to be, the term is used to describe a sustained metabolic improvement in type 2 diabetes to nearly normal levels. All right. So the remission should be defined as a return of HbA1c to less than 6.5% that occurs spontaneously or following an intervention and that persists for at least three months in the absence of usual glucose-lowering low pharmacotherapy. And uh, this was the remission criteria that was then uh, set uh, without medication, after surgical intervention, and uh, with lifestyle intervention and after cessation of diabetes medication, right? Now, obviously, not everybody is uh, a candidate for bariatric surgery, right? So now this then set the motion forward and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, in a position statement about type 2 diabetes remission and, and lifestyle medicine uh, indicated that there was sufficient, that a sufficient intensive lifestyle modification is capable of producing significant clinical improvements in patients with type 2 diabetes. And they went on to um, allude to the fact that there's adequate research that exists that demonstrates that type 2 diabetes remission is achievable without pharmacological intervention or surgery. And the best evidence indicates that you need a substantial energy deficit until adequate reduction in intracellular hepatic and pancreatic fat content is achieved. And this will then induce insulin sensitivity and glucose control. So how do we achieve that, right? So how do we achieve this uh, sufficient uh, deficit in energy? How do we make these necessary changes? So lifestyle medicine is an option where, what is lifestyle medicine? It is an evidence-based approach that prevents, manages, and reverses chronic diseases by replacing unhealthy behavior patterns with positive behavior patterns. And its core components are a predominantly plant-based diet, physical activity, stress management, restorative sleep, social connectivity, and avoidance of smoking and alcohol in moderation. And this fast-growing new discipline in medicine has the potential to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with chronic diseases. It also promotes longevity with reduction in disability 
and enhances well-being. So let's talk a little bit about the diabetes prevention program, right? Now, this was uh, a research that was done about 20 years ago, and uh, this was a multi-center multi um, large trial. Now, this program focused, um, the, the objective of the trial was to look at progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes, and they compared lifestyle intervention with the usage of metformin, right? So the program uh, was designed such that they focused on healthy eating uh, using my plate and physical activity of 150 minutes a week. The goals were to lose 7% of body weight. Now, the interesting component, all right, about this uh, study was that uh, the patients had a lifestyle coach who helped them with behavioral change. So it was not a one-on-one, -on -one, but um, it, they were assigned to a group. And this particular uh, lifestyle coach followed them up for one year, right? Initially, they met weekly and then they went on to meeting uh, monthly, all right? Some were in physical meetings and some were uh, at that point uh, via phone calls. So the outcome was uh, very interesting. So patients with pre-diabetes who did lifestyle intervention reduced their risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 58%. Now, as compared to the intervention group that used metformin, and that group reduced the risk of developing diabetes by 30%. So what does this tell us? The first line of intervention, if, you, if we are, are dealing with pre-diabetes, is we should be uh, advocating uh, lifestyle intervention. Right now, this is our clinical practice guidelines from Malaysia. So, um, so I picked this up uh, and uh, we, we share it in Malaysia, but I thought it'd be relevant uh, to just talk about it here as well. So one of the questions is what nutrition intervention, intervention has been proven to effectively prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes or reverse diabetes in recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes individuals? And the answer is lifestyle modification. So this is actually published in the clinical practice guidelines in Malaysia. So a healthy diet plan, which um, has a high fiber diet, right? Uh, which has a high intake of vegetables, fruits, uh, whole grains, low fat intake, right? Limiting intake of saturated fat and um, adhering to Malaysia, my healthy plate too for portion control. We'll talk about uh, the healthy plate in a, in a while. All right. So this is what is advocated by lifestyle medicine, and this is actually in our clinical practice guidelines. So to achieve remission of type two diabetes, or even to uh, improve type two diabetes, okay, because we may not at all times achieve remission, but if we are able to actually um, bring down the levels of HbA one C without actually increasing medication, or if we are able to then uh, reduce the medication, then we are moving somewhere. Similarly, if we can catch patients who are pre-diabetic, like Sri Lanka has a, uh, the prevalence is 30%. So if you get these people and you are able to uh, change the way they eat and uh, live their life and prevent the progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes, then we are all getting somewhere. So how to achieve insulin sensitivity? Obviously, we need to uh, reverse uh, uh, the drivers of insulin resistance, right? So we need to reduce oxidative stress. We need to decrease inflammation, reduce lipotoxicity, and restore the gut microbiome. So diet is a modifiable factor that is at the heart of diabetes prevention, treatment, and reversal. It outweighs all other lifestyle changes, including exercise, and can lead to improved insulin sensitivity and remission from diabetes, independent of exercise and weight loss. So what type of diet promotes insulin sensitivity and diabetes remission? All right, again, uh, going back to the position statement from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, um, the dietary intervention that is most beneficial or most preferred is a whole food plant-based diet, right? And large organizations uh, like the Kaiser Permanente in the United States advocate that because it is a low-cost intervention and it has far-reaching benefits. So let's just um, review a couple of uh, research. So 
in a research, in a review uh, about plant-based diet for the prevention and treatment of type 2 diabetes published in the Journal of Geriatric Cardiology, the conclusion is that there's general consensus that the elements of a whole food plant-based diet um, with limited or no intake of refined foods and animal products are highly beneficial for preventing and treating type 2 diabetes. Now, this Adventist Health Study 2, uh, it's a large study looking at about 60,000 participants. It compares different eating patterns and it looks at the prevalence of diabetes. Now, the so it looks at uh, vegan, lacto-over-vegan, sorry, lacto-over-vegetarian, pesco-vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, and non-vegetarian. And the pre prevalence of diabetes is highest in the group that predominantly ate meat at 7.6% and lowest in the vegan group at 2.9%. Now, it is not uh, realistic for to advocate being vegan to all our patients. Not everybody can subscribe to that. Okay, But um, generally, uh, in let's say a Sri Lankan diet, it's not very difficult uh, to move, you know, in the range towards that because a lot of, uh, I mean, you can avoid a lot of dairy because there are a lot of options. But even without that, if you just look at someone who's a lacto-over vegetarian or who's a pesco vegetarian, right? If you take the lacto-over vegetarian, 3.2% to 7.6, it's half, right? Now, this is a research uh, done and published by Dr. Neil Bernard. And uh, he is um, one of the front runners in, uh, in the management of diabetes with uh, lifestyle intervention. And um, th in this study, he looked, it was a randomized controlled trial uh, over 22 weeks with a one year follow up. So the intervention group had uh, no animal fat, minimal oil, minimal high fat food, and low glycemic diet. The control group uh, had the regular American Diabetes Association diet, but they, it was a reduced calorie diet. And what did they find? So if you look at the blue lines, right? So the blue lines, are <clears throat> those who uh, who did the lifestyle intervention, and uh, so those which have, um, uh, which are not, you know, they are not closed, uh, those with the medication and those which are open, Sorry, those which are closed are with the medication and those which are not closed um, without uh, medication. And you can see that um, those in the intervention group reduced from uh, week zero to week 22. They reduced um, their HbA1c both with medication and without medication. And uh, those who followed the standard American diet, right, there was some reduction and then it somehow seemed to taper off. I'm not sure whether you all have heard of the uh, direct trial. This is done in the UK, all right? And um, one of the, it was done by uh, MJ Lee, but uh, one of the, you know, the main people, uh, Dr. Roy Taylor, is the one who um, sort of um, is the main person behind uh, this concept of the direct trial. Here again, it was an RCT. And it was a primary care-led weight management program for remission of uh, diabetes. And after one year, 46% of those in the intervention group who did lifestyle intervention were in remission. And 24% had achieved at least 15 kilogram weight loss. And uh, at two years, sustained remissions uh, for more than a third of the people with type 2 diabetes. And very importantly, sustained remission was linked to the extent of sustained weight loss. So... <clears throat> Whatever we do with our patients, we also need to make it sustainable. So the type of diet we advocate, how they should prepare it, what kind of exercise they need to do, it needs to be sustainable. Otherwise, you're not going to see the sustained remission or improvement. Okay. So plant-based diets are diets that promote a consumption of whole grain, <laughs> legumes, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, and uh, emphasizes plant foods in the whole or in the least processed form and reduce animal products, okay? So what we must understand when we advocate this to our patients is that a diet does not need to be 100% plant-based. So the more a person moves along the spectrum, it increases the benefit in terms of disease risk reduction. So from what I read, 95% uh, of Sri Lankans do not eat the recommended five servings of fruits and vegetables 
and that is uh, the same thing that's happening in Malaysia as well. 95% of the Malaysian adults do not eat the recommended five servings of fruits and vegetables. So I always say we don't need to talk about the children. If the adults are not eating the five portions of fruits and vegetables, then how can we move on to the kids, right? So this is the healthy plate, all right? Now the, on your um, left, you will see uh, the healthy eating plate by Harvard, right? It is also quite similar to what's um, promoted by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Okay, so the half of it is um, fruits and vegetables. Then you have a quarter whole grains and quarter protein. So only difference here is that the Harvard one allows for, um, I mean, uh, meat or uh, lean meat or poultry or fish. And of course, then you incorporate plant-based proteins. And that is similar to the Malaysian My Healthy Plate. It, it follows a, a similar concept. So if you notice the protein, it has fish, poultry, meat, and legumes. Whereas the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, the protein, we, we focus more on a plant-based uh, protein. Now, I looked at uh, the Sri Lankan uh, My Plate or the Sri Lankan Plate, the Healthy Plate. It's a little bit different. So um, I thought we'll just focus our discussion on... Um, what we where we want to go or how we want to go about it okay so how does a plant based diet promote insulin sensitivity so plant based diets we know are low in fat they are rich in phytonutrients uh, and antioxidants and they are high in fiber right they are energy um, they are not dense energy wise but they are nutrient dense so if they're not um, <clears throat> dense energy wise but nutrient dense this promotes weight reduction and improves BMI. Now, a predominantly plant-based diet will reduce the consumption of a saturated fat. So if you look at this plate, now if someone uh, adheres to this plate, you're obviously reducing your consumption of your um, meat intake, right? You're only eating a quarter and of the quarter, you want to have some plant-based protein, right? Now, <clears throat> this then will help to decrease ectopic fats, right? And so this will include ectopic fats uh, in your muscles and in your liver. It will improve the insulin signaling that takes place in your cells. It will prevent pan uh, pan pancreatic cell dysfunction and uh, cell death in the pancreas. Obviously, if you have a diet that's rich in phytonutrients and antioxidants, it will reduce oxidative stress and inflammation. And this type of diet will then feed the gut microbiome. See, the type of diet we are eating today lets the gut microbiome have a party almost every day, the, the bad guys. So the good guys are being starved of food, whereas the bad guys or the bad bacteria is enjoying, uh, they're enjoying themselves, okay? They're having a feast. So the benefit, of course, will be you will be able to reverse insulin resistance and hopefully bring diabetes into remission. Otherwise, at least see a significant improvement, all right? improve your glycemic levels, reduce glucose levels, promote weight loss, um, and reduce the risk of diabetic complication. And a plant-based diet has been shown to be able to improve diabetic complications like diabetic neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy. And the other thing is that, you know, when people eat and, uh, you know, you restrict the diet and they don't feel full, so the satiety index is not quite right. So you always feel that I'm not satisfied. I need to eat some more. And you're, it is sub, it's in the mind and they search for food or they feel not satisfied. Here it is a, a diet that makes you feel full. It's a diet of abundance, not caloric restriction, right? So how do we transition to a healthy plate, right? So uh, what we tell our patients is, is that they fill half the plate with uh, vegetables and fruit. So we don't tell them to put the fruit. So we ask them to take at least two types of vegetables. And uh, so take two, two tablespoons of each type of vegetable. So that kind of brings it up to half the plate. Then you fill a quarter of the plate with either uh, the whole grains or vegetables that are starchy in nature. For example, pumpkin or potato, right? They share the same group. Now, the protein quarter, all right, see, most of our patients are uh, non-plant-based. Now, you can't just ask them to eat purely plant-based because that is obviously not going to work and it'll be a recipe for failure. 
So we ask them to use, uh, take at least uh, maybe five, uh, half or maybe one third and have some uh, tofu. Or we have fermented, um, here we have fermented bean, uh, beans that we call tempeh, all right? Oh, and, and we all have, both Sri Lanka and us, we have lentils and beans, all right? Uh, so they can have some kind of uh, dish with that, okay? And they need to reduce the fat. So in fact, when you're talking to a patient, the first thing actually we should tell them is uh, they need to change the way they cook. So that indirectly cook reduces the fat. So because like in Sri Lanka or in, uh, in Malaysia, if you look at the Malay cooking or the Indian cooking, not so much Chinese, there's a, a, a lot of uh, sauteing and... Uh, uh, you know, you use a lot of oil. The Chinese use oil in a different form, okay? And then you need to limit added salt and sugar and counsel them about the hidden sugars, especially in sauces, okay? Like uh, chili sauce, for example, from the bottle, you can have up to maybe um, 50 to 70% per 100 ml of sugar, okay? And um, limit sugar-sweetened beverages. I'm not sure... How popular condensed milk is? I know that it's used in Sri Lanka, but I don't know whether you use it regularly with tea and coffee. But in Malaysia, that's very popular, so they uh, we they can't use the condensed milk. Okay. Right now, if I we if we just talk a little bit about something practical, whether can we do this in in your own practice? Uh, you know, or is it very difficult? All right. So I'm just going to share uh one case study. So we. I, we had a 40-year-old Middle Eastern man. Uh, he was actually a trade commissioner from Saudi. He actually came for something else. He came for social phobia. So he had an issue where um, if you interact with him on a one-on-one, -on -one, he was fine, but he can't do group meetings. He begins to freeze, all right? So, of course, uh, as a trade commissioner, you can't have uh, that kind of a situation. It's not like you are in IT just working with a computer. So, but when he came, he was clinically obese. You know, he, he looked big, big. And when we took the weight, he was 107 kilos. BMI was 35.4. So, you know, you're not just treating the mind, but, you know, you need to obviously look at other things. So, you know, we had a chat and we decided to do his blood profile. So the investigation showed that his HbA1c was 12%. So what was our intervention, a predominantly plant-based diet? So what was he eating at that point? So he was only eating rice and meat. So when I asked him, why are you eating only rice and meat? Is it that you don't like vegetables and fruits? He said, I, di I didn't think about it. So you see, we must understand sometimes it's a cultural thing and we need to understand uh, where they come from. And that's what makes lifestyle medicine different. You see, in our traditional way, um, in, our, in, in allopathy, we are very paternalistic. We'll just tell you, okay, you do A, B, C, and D, and that's it. That's how we are trained, you know. But we don't find out why a person is doing uh, what they're doing. And he then uh, was prescribed walking for one hour because, you know, he's obese. So if you do the standard 150 minutes, that's for maintenance of health. But if you have, um, if you are obese and you want to lose weight, you need to do uh, more than 300 minutes of exercise. Uh, per week. So he did one hour, five times a week, okay? which is 300. And then he did mindfulness for his social phobia. So after three months, his HBA once he came down to 8%, weight dropped to 98 kgs. And after 12 months, his HBA one c was at 6% and weight was 85 kg. And now uh, I saw this patient in 2019. So to today, he's maintaining his HBA one c between 5.6 to 5.8, and his weight is around 78. Sometimes he puts on a little bit of weight if he goes back to Saudi and comes back. But otherwise, he's doing um, he's doing well. Okay, And that's very important that we need to be able to uh, educate them in such a way that they are able to sustain it. All right? So his feedback was that eating healthy can be tasty as well. And that's what we want to do. All right? <clears throat> Now, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the WHO MOH collaborative project that was implemented in Malaysia. So in relation to the Sustainable Development Goal 2030, the WHO and MOH have some collaboration and one of their aims was uh, to provide health education and behavioral interventions to NCD patients, in particular diabetic patients. 
So I was <laughs> tasked with developing a lifestyle medicine for remission of diabetes module. And my task was to develop the module and to build capacity. So to train and upskill the multidisciplinary healthcare uh, professional at the primary healthcare facility. So the goals we set were to, uh, to reverse type 2 diabetes and achieve remission and to achieve a weight loss of 5 to 7% and adhere to Malaysia, my healthy plate and physical activity of 150 minutes per week. And so the multidisciplinary team included, fam included family medicine specialists, medical officers, dietitian, physiotherapy, psychologists. Now, I must say that this particular primary health facility that they selected uh, was well equipped and had all these personnel and they wanted to do the pilot project in a facility that had a comprehensive team. Now, this same um, pilot project is now going to be duplicated in other parts in Malaysia and other primary health care facilities, which may not have uh, all the various um, you know, the personnel. Okay? So this program was designed as a 12-week group intervention program. Uh, it had six intervention sessions, five delivered in person and one was virtual, and they were held um, fortnightly. And uh, we had questionnaires, WhatsApp prompt to support the patients. Um, and we used the fit prescription and smart goals as well. So in the process of uh, doing this, we developed the lifestyle medicine clinic handbook so that uh, the program could be duplicated. Okay? So everything that they needed to do or they needed to know was in this book. Right? So uh, the interventions pre and post um, included a self-reported questionnaire, which had healthy lifestyle behavior and knowledge and readiness to change. We assessed all that in a simple questionnaire because you're talking about patients who come to primary health care facility. So not everybody has uh, that kind of sophistication. So it needs to be simplified that they can then relate to the questionnaire. And uh, the pre and post intervention uh, included uh, anthropometry, blood pressure, body fat, lean muscle mass, um, and fasting blood sugar and HbA1c. At week five and nine, we did a simpler anthropometry, blood pressure, and fasting blood sugar. Uh, the reason for this was to, uh, to target patients whose fasting blood sugar or the weight was stagnant or increased, and they were then referred to the family medicine specialist or the NCD medical officer. So that the appropriate interventions could be done instead of running through 12 weeks and find that uh, there was a problem that we had missed. And uh, so this was the way the program was designed. And the outcome was very uh, encouraging. So the first cohort uh, showed that 67% of uh, the, person, the patients in the first cohort uh, achieved, um, uh, had a reduction in the HbA1c. Now, 23% had HbA1c of less than 6.5. And this was in the middle of last year. Now, by the time we had our conference at the end of last year, 10% um, had gone into remission and the family medicine specialist who then sat for the board exam uh, presented that at our conference last year. So this uh, project is now on the WHO website. So you can go and listen or read about it. Um, so they recorded the patient experience and also the experience of the healthcare personnel at the primary healthcare facility in Sramban. And uh, last year, we were fortunate to have our deputy health minister uh, give the keynote address and uh, he was um, you know, very excited about the pilot project and he hoped to see lifestyle medicine clinics in each of the government clinics in Malaysia in time to come. Of course, this is not something that's going to happen uh, you know, within one year or two years, but we hope that, uh, the, the, that we will be able to go towards it because we have come, I mean, we have sort of um, come up with a program or a module that doesn't actually incur a uh, new cost because there's no new personnel that is being uh, recruited, but we are upskilling existing personnel. So this can be done in any country, anywhere, because upskilling people doesn't involve that kind of cost because if you are going to bring in new people, then you know, you're talking about repetitive costs, etc. right? So I don't know whether I'm okay with time. Uh, let me just see. Um, maybe we'll skip the um, physical activity. Uh, is that okay, uh, Dr. Mufida? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dr. Siva. 
All right. Uh, since uh, we want to give some time for Q and A, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll just skip this, and um. All right. So in conclusion, uh, sufficient energy deficit will improve insulin sensitivity and promote diabetes remission. And diet outweighs all other lifestyle changes, including exercise, and <clears throat> can lead to improved insulin sensitivity and remission from diabetes independent of exercise and weight loss. And a predominantly whole food plant-based diet with reduction in animal fats is the preferred intervention. Now, before I end, uh, I just want to let you all know that we'll be having the fourth Malaysian Lifestyle Medicine Conference, which will be hybrid. We'll be hosting it at the Brajaya Times Square Hotel uh, from the 21st to the 22nd of November, 2024. And uh, the theme of this conference is Diabetes Management Revolution from Prevention to Remission. And uh, uh, we have Dr. Murgaraj, who's the president of the Commonwealth Medical Association, Dr. Caldwell as a team. Some of you may know of him. So he'll be talking about a heart disease reversal. And Professor Roy Taylor, uh, he's the one I was talking about. Uh, he has done a lot of work about uh, remo removing hepatic fat via uh, lifestyle intervention. And we have Elizabeth Freds and Brenda Davis and uh, many other uh, leading speakers. So if any of you are interested, please visit our, webs our website to register for the conference. It's not open yet. It will open in about a week or so. And uh, we are also going to run the Lifestyle Medicine for Diabetes Remission course. Um, and I think the first in-person course will be in September. But later, we might do some online courses, maybe in 2025. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all uh, from, from, from me. Uh, thank you very much for attending this session and uh, do enjoy the rest of your weekend. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sivo. It was very enlightening for all of us, I'm sure. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, so the first one is about uh, keto diet. There is a fad to have a keto diet comprising of fat proteins, etc. This is supposed to help the brain to utilize the cholesterol for brain function and prevent dementia. What are your views on this, Dr. Siva? All right. Um, okay. I think uh, the research is beginning to show that um, the keto diet or rather a high fat diet, what happens is that it actually um, increases the, you, you'll see the immediate a reduction because you're not taking carbohydrate, you're only taking fats and you're trying to break down that and create sugar from there. But this increase in uh, fat intake actually leads to insulin resistance and more so in patients who are on insulin injections and patients who are um, who have type 1 diabetes, it appears to be um, worse. Maybe I, what I will do is, uh, Dr. Mufida, I can share some of the links and maybe you can share it you know with your colleagues if they're interested to read about that yes for sure um then there's a question for type um managing type 1 diabetes how would you alter insulin dose for patients with type 1 diabetes if on plant-based diet okay so for patients who are on um insulin when they transition to a plant-based diet, you'll find that actually the the is uh, the drop can be quite sharp. All right, so you need to be very careful. So, um, all right, now I'm just going to go back to the WHO MOH. So, one of the uh, uh, in our caveats was that we did not include patients with the type one diabetes because of the monitoring. All right. So you need to then uh, maybe transition them a bit more slowly so they don't immediately go on to a full plant-based diet, but they move on a bit more slowly so that the sugar, uh, the glucose will drop a bit more slowly and uh, you are able to drop the insulin injection or the, the dosage as you go on. So do you, would you recommend like monitoring at what? Yeah, you can do the normal monitoring. It's just that how you transition, uh, it cannot follow the what we do for the type, I mean, those who are not on insulin jabs. So that means you can't straight away say, okay, uh, let's go on to a full plant-based uh, or a predominantly plant-based diet. So you need to uh, do it a bit more stepwise. 
Right. Um, so there's a follow up with um, Dr. Sharon. is asking, do you know if there's any particular guideline that we can follow for this? Um, okay. There is no like uh, set guidelines other than what we have uh, discussed, mm -hmm. right? Um, so a lot of it is, uh, it's just like how we manage diabetic patients. So we don't have like a, a set guideline, okay, X amount, and then that's how you reduce it. But it's more like patient to patient. So, but all, all you need to know is that if you are uh, trans transitioning a patient with type one and type one or, or a patient on insulin, then you need to progress more slowly. All right. Absolutely. Right. And they need to know also that they will be more prone maybe to hypoglycemic attacks. And, uh, you know, maybe then uh, they are self monitoring at home, maybe may need to be a bit more frequent. And then they need to have, you know, some sugar or something with them if they have a hypoglycemic mm -hmm. attack. And uh, maybe you need to see them more frequently because that's what we do. Like, for example, the other patients, maybe we'll see them after a month, but maybe these patients at the beginning, you need to see them in a week or something like that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I guess this applies because Sri Lanka is very similar to Malaysia. So how would you recommend utilizing group consultations as part of diabetes management and remission in a country like Sri Lanka? Sorry, I didn't get that. So how would you recommend utilizing group consultations? Group consultation. All right. So um, now, um, if I go back to the WHO project, all right, so we discussed that. Now, uh, since we are uh, Sri Lanka and Malaysia, we are all from Asia. Now, I think um, we we could do, so the intervention was group consulting, uh, group, group sessions, but it was... Um, uh, where you deliver the program. But I am I think that if you're going to have group consultation where the patient has to share uh, their views or their concerns or talk about their problems, it's a little bit more difficult because I think uh, we Asians are not so open to, you know, sharing in public and talking about it, you know. So therefore, um, it and what happened was, uh, what we did was we had we have the group intervention and then they break up into smaller groups and uh, they have a few minutes where they, they share. But actually the, the initial consultations are, and the post-consultation are done with the family medicine specialist. As uh, we run our group intervention as well in our own practice, and it's the same thing. They come to us and then we see them on a one-on-one. -on -one. So the consultation is done there. So the program is run as a group intervention. And post that, then we have, um, you know, uh, the consultation. So consultation is not done as a group. Um, I find it personally, uh, you know, I think it's a little bit difficult because even like uh, when I did the WHO project, so at the beginning, the, the they arranged for a session with the patients to come and for me to just talk to them, to, to see the feedback before we embarked on the project. And everybody just sat there, nobody wanted to say anything, you know, so it was, uh, and you know, they, you, you had to, you have to take a, uh, you know, it took a bit of time to break the ice and, and yet we're not really talking about uh, personal matters. So I think in an Asian setting, um, I don't really have the answer yet because I haven't found the way to doing a group intervention, uh, group consultation. But group intervention is very possible. So my suggestion to you to make it work, or rather, I'm sharing my experience. Uh, I do a one-on-one -on -one consultation, and we we do the intervention as a group intervention that they are comfortable. So in fact, what we do um, in our own practice is that uh, when let's say when we start one group, then we put them all in a WhatsApp group, okay? And that works very well because of the peer support. And, you know, so uh, in the morning, somebody will say, okay, I've done my 30 minutes of walk. And then the others are sort of motivated to do the 30 minutes of walk. And then they will share their, uh, you know, what they've had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then people will comment saying that, okay, it looks very tasty, but it's... Uh, you know, uh, and yet healthy. And what we do is when uh, when we do the next week's intervention, uh, we will take some of these images and then we'll discuss it, the good and the not so good. So if it's good, okay, they will say, yeah, this, everything is, they, they will give their viewpoint. It is it's a learning process. And if it's not uh, so good, then they will share how to tweak it. So this is just sharing what we do, all right? And uh, if anybody needs to, you know, so uh, have a proper consultation even during that 
a six week program, they will then schedule a consultation. Or sometimes if it's a small thing at, at the end of the session, then they just have a chat, you know. Now we couldn't do the WhatsApp group uh, for the WHO project because of, uh, you know, they said that uh, some uh, due to data protection and even though um, you could get them to sign, but they couldn't. So they did WhatsApp prompts. So we had a scheduled list of prompts and they, they would prompt them in the morning, like, have you done your walk? Have you had your fiber? Have you, uh, did you do this? Or did you remember to cut your oil? You know, we had a list of uh, 30 prompts, which they will send out. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, do maybe because we're kind of running over time, maybe we'll just take this one last question. <clears throat> do you have any lifestyle modifications that can be used to reduce the dawn effect? Mm. Okay. Um, what, uh, well, not, I mean, it wouldn't be any different from what we are doing generally. And um, I, so we don't really have a specific um, protocol to reduce the dawn effect. Right. Okay. Um, do we, can we take one more question? Yeah, Perhaps? sure. Yeah. No problem. So what are the practices for those who have not much time to do exercises regularly? Okay. So, well, uh, just to share what we do in our practice is that because, you know, over the years, I always find that whenever I start talking about exercise, straight away, my patients will say, doctor, but I have no time. I come back at seven o'clock, you know. So uh, along the way, I thought maybe I'll preempt it by telling them, okay, so I can you do ex So I don't tell them how much I want them to do. I start by saying, can you walk on Saturday and Sunday? You're free, right? Then they will say yes. Okay, so I start off with three times a week. Though we 150 minutes, which should be five times. So I start out with three times. I said, okay, so now once they agree to that, then I say, okay, you find one more day during the week and you just do 30 minutes. And after that, I then increase it to 40 minutes, three times a week. So that brings me up to 120 minutes. All right, now this will go on for maybe a month plus you know then you know like just like i mean you and me too if you want to change something so once it's kind of set into your system right and then adding that one more day and asking them to do it doesn't become so challenging so because ultimately they need to do the physical activity we all know that now uh, you need to do some amount. I, I didn't talk about exercise, but we need to do aerobic and then we need to do the strength training and then um, then you, your balance and your flexibility. So for strength, you can do, okay, you can do uh, things at home. You don't have to have weights, but you can do plank, for example, you know, uh, you can do simple rotation exercises for flexibility, balance or yoga. But for aerobic, um, well, the closest you can do is if you do, uh, some vigorous yoga exercise, or if you do um, uh, Surya Namaskar, sun salutation, all right? So sun salutation then has a component of increasing your metabolic rate. And I think you can lose something like, uh, if you do 12 rounds, I think you can lose, uh, maybe it burns about, uh, maybe 80 to 100 calories, if I'm not mistaken. So it burns an X amount of calories, you know. But then the patient needs to know how to do and needs to be taught how to do. So a lot of them will find it easier just to walk. But so this method seems to work for me. Saturday, Sunday, ask them, you're free, right? What do you do on Saturday? You got to approach it that way. What do you do on Saturday, Sunday? Okay, oh, nothing much extra, etc. Okay, so can you walk? And then once they commit to that, then you ask them for the, the day during the week. I hope it helps you all. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was interesting. Um, one another question. <laughs> okay, all yeah, right. Oh, yeah, just the last one. So, do you recommend calorie counting at any point of your management? Um, generally, with the patients, we um don't do the calorie counting, but because when you do the my plate, all right. Uh, and if you teach them that, uh, you know that uh, to reduce the oil, and then basically, if you are, if you tell them that that quarter portion must share the grains as well as uh, 
uh, starchy vegetables, all right? And so the oil is removed from the from your, you know, the cooking. These are all the contributing factors because you can eat vegetables that can be laden with oil. And also if you can, um, uh, you know, uh, encourage them to eat the lean meat. And we talked briefly about portion size, like how much of meat. You know, so uh, so which is easier for them than uh, so instead of we telling them about one hundred grams, we say okay, palm size. Uh, we use the cup portion to see how much of vegetables and uh, rice. So that more than the calorie counting itself. Thank you very much for that. So thank you very much, Dr. Silva. Um, so we've got a lot of questions as well. I think everyone has found your talk very insightful. Um, so thank you very much again for taking time out and delivering this uh, webinar to us, Dr. Silva. And also thank you very much to all our participants. We hope to continue this webinar series for the latter half of this year. And we have quite a few exciting speakers with an interesting range of topics lined up for us. And hope to see you all in the next one as well. Again, we'd be grateful if you could fill out the feedback form. It helps us to know what topics you would like to learn about and to improve things for you in the future. Um, thank you very much again, Dr. Siva. I hope you all will look into the Malaysian Society's uh, conference that's happening as well. And um, thank you very much, everybody. Hope you'll have right. a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.